In the course of the four centuries, from 1100 to 1500, the visual arts in Europe were transformed. In particular, they became public spectacle, being produced in quantities and on a scale never before realized in this part of the world, and laying the foundations for an engagement with architecture and the embellishment of architecture that continues to our own day. This lecture looks at the development of those foundations, focusing on an important early monument for understanding the way art was deployed for ideological purposes at Canterbury Cathedral around 1100, and then turning to ex examine what happened here in East Anglia during the 15th century, when art, particularly in the service of social cohesion, became a matter for the emergent middle classes. I hope to persuade you that there's a direct connection uh, between these two case studies. And I note in passing, there won't be time to develop it, that what happens here in England can be paralleled in many respects across Latin Europe. It is, however, far from identical. And this is where people and their politics enter the story. For although Latin Europe had a broad ecclesiastical unity under the papacy, secular interests and regional resources differed widely and so too did the ideals of individuals and communities. I don't know if the lights can go down a bit further. Okay, is that, that all right? The emergence of art as public spectacle in Europe around 1100 is a remarkable phenomenon. It could be exemplified on the one hand by large-scale sculpture placed in prominent positions on the exteriors of churches, usually close to the entrances and so serving as an unavoidable introduction to the buildings they adorn. The West Tympanum on the pilgrimage church at Conque, which you see here in southwestern France, can convincingly be dated to around 1100 and is an excellent example of the genre and on a huge scale. It warns visitors of the Last Judgment and the choices between a behaviour that would lead them to heavenly bliss or eternal damnation. But sculpture was only one possible medium. After centuries of rather patchy usage, wall paintings and mosaics were increasingly deployed in extensive schemes but there was now another figurative option for church interiors. Painted glass windows. Before about 1100, there is scant evidence for the exploitation of stained glass as a vehicle for complex imagery. A turning point was the rebuilding of the eastern arm of Canterbury Cathedral by Archbishop Anselm, who was born in 1033 in Aosta, in what is now northern Italy, and spent the last 16 years of his life from 1093 to 1109 as Archbishop of Canterbury, though he wasn't always at Canterbury. It is possible to calculate quite accurately just how much glass there was in Anselm's building, at least 4,000 square feet, of which these two windows in the north aisle contain about 250 square feet, or about 6% of the total. That gives you some idea of the scale of this operation. In the first half of this lecture, I will set out the arguments for seeing Anselm's glorious choir at Canterbury as a crucial building in the history of Western art, introducing new subject matter and espousing an aesthetic that was to dominate church building in Northern Europe until the Reformation. In 1096, Anselm, St. Anselm as we now call him, decided to demolish the east end of Canterbury Cathedral, built by his immediate predecessor, Lanfranc, and to replace it on a very much larger scale. So what you're seeing here, on the far side from me, 